Hello and welcome to Amen Podcast, where we preach the good news of Jesus Christ and how it applies to everyday life. My name is Lokilani, your host, and I'm joined by my husband, Alex, who is preaching about asking God through a prayer. Is there something you are failing to ask God about? Maybe it's something big and you just don't think God will give it to you. Maybe it's something emotional and you just don't want to open up to Him about it because it hurts too much. Remember that nothing is impossible with God. In this episode of our Matthew series, Alex will preach about how to gos- how to ask God for anything and how to receive from God what we never thought we could. After listening, if you'd like to support this podcast, you can visit amenpodcast.com to donate, or you could simply like this video and follow us on Spotify and Instagram. Let's read. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Who among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father in heaven give good things to those who ask him therefore whatever you want others to do for you do also the same for them for this is the law of and the prophets amen we're going to talk about three things why we should ask why we don't ask and how to ask the question is do you ask. James tells us we have not because we ask not. God wants you to ask him for the things that you know you cannot get within your own power. Do you ask him though? You might find uh, you might find that you're the person that just doesn't ask God um, for anything. Maybe you ask him for just the small little tiny things um, that don't require that much faith. Or maybe you're a person that that used to ask God um, for big things, but you've you've gone away from that. We're going to talk about how to get back there, how to be a person who asks God for big things. Now, here's the first part. In verse 7 and 8, it tells us why we should ask. Again, we're in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, continuing our series in Matthew. Thank you so much for joining us. If you... Uh, If this is their first episode that you're jumping into, or maybe you've missed a couple episodes, um, feel free to go back and listen, you know, and catch up. Um, This Matthew series has been just like these beautiful, beautiful spiritual Lego blocks, just packing on, making this beautiful sculpture. And um, yeah, we're excited for this episode. So it says, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. What does this mean? The word ask, it actually means to desire. So what Jesus is telling the disciples is when you desire God, you get God. It's a promise. The reason why we should ask is availability. Say that with me. Availability. The things that you want to ask God for, maybe not the specific things, but the heart of the things that you're asking God for, they are available. God says, I'm available to you. In verse eight, it says, for everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Jesus is saying, I promise you, when you desire the things of God, when you think, when you desire things that give God glory, you will get those things. To ask is to desire. To seek means to look, to search. He says, if you do that, you will find. You search for God, you seek, you will find him. I'm the kind of father who plays hide and seek with his kids and then like purposely makes it to where my kids can't find me so that I can win. And God is not that father. He's good. He's perfect. The second the the seeking starts, he says, here I am. Look no further. He who seeks finds. Knock and the door will be open to you. He says this, that door will be opened. What he's saying is God is available. There's availability in God. That's why we should ask him. Here's an example of someone who desired God and got God, sought for God and got God, knocked on God's door and God opened. In Luke chapter 23, 39 through 43, write this one down as a very pivotal moment in uh, Jesus's crucifixion because it shows the way that we actually get into heaven. Luke, Luke 23, 39 through 43, it says, Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? 
save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, don't you even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Two thieves hanging on either side of Jesus. One saw Jesus and said, I desire God. He said, Jesus, remember me. You've done nothing wrong. You're innocent. I'm not. And me watching you die here innocently has convinced me that you are the son of God. So remember me when you get into your kingdom. What he's saying is he's asking. Don't you see? He's asking. And what does Jesus say? You're asking, you're going to receive. Anyone who asks for God gets God. Anyone who desires God gets God. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. It's, it's just a crazy juxtaposition because there's two criminals. One doesn't ask for God. The other one does. When you're, go to, when you're going to God for whatever it is that you're going for, uh, say it's something big, say it's something uh, emotional, say it's something that is hard for you to believe God for, whatever it is in your life that you need from him. When we go to him and we ask for his help, that alone gives him glory. Maybe the thing that we're asking for is um, not what we actually need. But at the heart of going to God and asking him is this, I need you. Mm -hmm. And that is an ask that is always going to be answered with the best. God is the kind of father that always wants to provide exactly what you need. When his children call, he answers. So we know why we should ask because availability, but why we don't ask is depravity. Look at verse nine, 10 and 11. Who among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake? If you then who are evil, we, we, we parade around and dance around sin in our culture. We want to say it's just weakness. It's just a shortcoming. It's just, you know, you know, a little mishap, a mistake. Mm -hmm. Jesus calls it evil. Mm -hmm. He's not talking to, you know, what's, what our culture would call the worst of the worst. He's talking to his disciples, his closest friends. And what does he call them? Evil. He says, you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? What is Jesus saying here? He's saying that even evil fathers, sinful fathers, earthly fathers know how to give their kid a sandwich when they ask for something to eat. And, and if earthly fathers can do that, how much more can our father give us what we need? A father who is not limited Nothing is impossible with God. Mm -hmm. He has no limits. So if, if earthly fathers can give good gifts, if earthly fathers who don't see their kids ever can still send in child support, can, chills, can still send in a birthday present from here um, from time to time, surely our heavenly father can give good gifts. But our problem is, Jesus says it, we're evil. Mm -hmm. In other words, depraved. Why we don't ask is depravity. Why we should ask, availability. Why we don't ask, depravity. In our depravity, we think that we're so messed up that we just can't go to God and ask him for things. He's saying, if earthly fathers can give good gifts, surely the heavenly father can give greater gifts, but we are evil. And in our evil, it keeps us from asking. Here's an example of that in Luke 15, 18, through 24 to help you understand this more and how you can grow away from this and grow closer to God. I'll get up and go to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. This is the prodigal son speaking. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers, AKA slaves. So he got up and went to his father. But while his son was still a long way off, his father saw him and filled with compassion, he ran, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. 
Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive. Again, he is lost. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. What's going on here? The prodigal son runs away, takes his father's money. He comes to his senses, realizes that he sinned greatly against his, his father, against heaven. And so he says, I know what I'll do. I'll ask my dad to let me be a slave. He's completely lost sight of the father's heart. He doesn't even know what it, what it means to be a son of the father. So he says, I'll just, I'll just ask him if I can be a slave. He's lost in his depravity. He's sunk so low. He's lost what it meant to be a son. And he goes back with the idea of, I'm just going to see if I can be a slave. I'm not going to come back as a son. That's for sure. I'm just going to see if I can be a slave. He's not even thinking. It's not even crossing his mind to ask God to be treated like a son. Don't you see? This is why we don't ask God. We know we're his children, but we don't ask him because we're so depraved. We're so in our past. We're so in our sins. We're so in who we used to be. We're so in what the world thinks of us. We're so in what others think of us. We're so in our mind about what we think of us. We think we're so messed up, so depraved, so jacked up. There's no way I can ask God for great things. It wouldn't have even crossed his mind to say, Father, treat me like a son again. Why? Because for that to happen, that would come at the older brother's expense. The father who had given his younger son his part of the inheritance, had none left of of his younger son's inheritance. And so what would have to happen is the younger son would have to reach deep into his pockets and give up so his brother could have some. And since everything is the father's, which is what he tells the older brother later in, in this chapter, the father had a right to reach down and to take that from the older brother. Now we know in this story, the older brother didn't want to do that, but our older brother did, and that's Jesus. At the expense of our older brother, he was willing to give up his life so that us, the younger brother, the younger, the one who ran away, could be treated like a son again. Mm. If that's the cost, then we must not let our depravity keep us from going to God and saying, God, I desire you. I desire your heart. I desire to be with you. I desire to be your son. I desire to be treated like a son. And because I'm treated like a son and because everything is yours, I can go to you and I can ask for big, crazy things because I need them for your glory. I don't need them for me. I need them for your glory. Sometimes we don't even understand the things that we need to ask God for are not really for us. They're for his glory. And so refusing to ask, James says, you have not because you ask not. You want to grow deeper into the things of God. You want to trust God more. You want to walk on the water, yet you refuse to ask him for the things that he wants to glorify himself with in your life. So how do we do it? Here's how to ask. Generosity. Why we should ask? Availability. Why we don't ask? Depravity. How to ask? Generosity. Look at verse 12. Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. For this is the law and the prophets. This is the golden rule. Jesus says it sums up perfectly the law and the prophets. Do to others what you want them to do for you. In other words, what Jesus is saying here as connected to what we just talked about is treat others the way you want God to treat you. Treat others with the same love, the compassion, the grace, the mercy that you want God to treat you with. That's what he's talking about. What you want others to do for you, do to them. Do you want others to treat you with the same generosity and love and mercy and grace that God gives to people? Then you got to give that to others. You have to be generous. You see, Jesus first gave so that we could give. A generous heart, a kind heart, has no problem asking God for big things. It's the stingy, greedy, shallow hearts that don't ask God because they don't want to hear, how dare you ask for more? He's saying, treat people how you want God to treat you. In our depravity, we can be so low, so down in the dumps. We can be not just like the younger brother, but we can be like the older brother, the stingy, the greedy one, 
the one that says to the father in Luke chapter 15, how dare you throw a party, dad, for my younger brother. He ran away, he squabbled all his money. He's the, the younger brother is the one that has all the riches coming to him. He's the one with the inheritance. And yet with all his wealth, he's stingy and he's greedy. And he wouldn't dare ask his father for anything big because of his greediness, because of his lack of generosity. Don't you see? It's those who are stingy, greedy, who have their tight grip on their money, tight grip on their finances, or putting their, their, their hope and their treasure, their hope and their money. Those are the ones that are saying this. I don't need to ask God for anything. I have it all. I can figure it out on my own. But those who are generous, those who are kind, those who freely give, those are the ones who are not afraid to ask God for huge things. The crazier, the craziest prayer warriors in the world are missionaries because they live on support. They're broke as a joke and they are uh, willing to ask God for the moon and back because they say, everything we have is yours and everything that I have, I'm willing to give to someone else. Here's an example of this. What Jesus is saying is treat others how you want God to treat you. And when you do that, you'll see how I was treated like the people that you treat. We often treat people with unkindness, especially in our heads and in our hearts. Well, Jesus was treated by God the way that we treat others so that we could be treated by God like we're his son. Even you ladies out there, you might be saying, well, I want to be treated by, like a daughter. Yes, and you want to be treated like the firstborn son. In Jewish culture, the firstborn son got the whole inheritance. And the gospel tells us that we're co-heirs with Christ. That means boys, girls, men, women alike, we're all treated like sons of God because Jesus was treated like sinners. So we can be treated like the very firstborn son, all of us. Here's an example of what it looks like to have a generous heart and how that person with a generous heart is not afraid to ask God of great big things. Matthew 8, 5 through 13. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible agony. He said to him, am I to come and heal him? Lord, the centurion replied, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and share the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus told the centurion, go as you have believed, let it be done for you. And his servant was healed at that very moment. What's happening here? The centurion had heard about Jesus. He had heard about what Jesus could do. And what he does is he comes up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, my servant is sick. What business does he have caring about his servant? He's wealthy. He has authority. He can get other servants. It's showing his generous heart. He's willing to walk on foot and go to the healer to ask for healing for his servant. Why? He's generous. He loves his own servants, his paid employees, like he does his own children. He's showing a generous heart. So he's willing to go out of his way. And then when he goes there, he says, Lord, you don't have to step foot in my direction. I know who you are. You came from heaven to earth to show me the way. And from where you are, you can say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus had never done this before. This is why this is such a big ask. He had never seen Jesus do this before. He had never heard of Jesus doing this before, but he was willing to say, God, this is your son. I know he's capable of doing this. I know I've never seen him move in this way before, but I'm confident that, I can, that he can do it. And in my, in my vision, I can see how generous you are to send your son. In my, in my vision, I can see Jesus is so generous. He's willing to leave heaven and come to earth. And looking at his generosity, 
has changed me and made me generous. And so with that generous heart, I'm saying, I'm gonna ask you for something crazy. Jesus, stay right where you are and just say the word and I know he's gonna be healed. That's amazing. So much so Jesus says, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. What a compliment. He's saying, this is how you ask God with a generous heart. How do you get a generous heart? You got to look at how generous Jesus is. Look at what he went through to make it possible for you to be God's, for you to be able to say with need to breathe, I am yours and you are, you are, you are mine. Jesus says, I made that possible by giving up my life. And if I gave up my life so you could be God's, then surely you could go to God and ask God for amazing things, incredible things. Because I didn't come here and do all that just for you to ask God for the small things. Ask him for the big things. You do that by living generous. You do that by living like this. Not a tight grip, not a closed fist, but an open hand saying, I will freely give because he freely gave. And the resurrection means this. There is absolutely nothing too big to ask God. In Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus cried out to God, his father in reverence and in groanings and, and pangs, crying out to him in his obedience to the one that he knew could raise him from the dead. And God answered and God rose Jesus from the dead because he was innocent, because he was perfect. Now in the righteousness of God and the righteous judgment of God, falling on Jesus. Now Jesus, God sees us as Jesus. He sees us as if we were his only begotten son, righteous and perfect. And so the resurrection means there's nothing too big to ask him. So ask him, what's the worst he can say? No, all that means is I have something better for you. Not I have something worse from you, for you. Go back to verses nine, 10 and 11. What father who a kid asks for bread is gonna give him a stone to eat? Or even earthly fathers don't give their kids something harmful when they ask for something to eat. How much more? Will your heavenly father give you exactly what you need, give you what's best for you? Father, we thank you so much for your son. We thank you for what you're willing to freely give, help us to freely give. And with that heart of generosity, we, we decide, Lord, not to let our depravity keep us from the availability that we find in your grace and your mercy and your compassion. In your name we pray, amen. What are you not asking God for? This is the part of the show called After the Amen with Lokilani, your host. And the question is, what are you not asking God for? And maybe a slash to that is, what are you asking God for? Um, you, can, you can answer either way. What are you not asking God for? What are you asking God for? Maybe you want to answer both. Let us know. Uh, but Lokilani, why don't you go first? what are you not asking God for or what are you asking God for those are two great questions and I think questions that we need to ask ourselves um, continually and I guess for me I'll go first and then we want to see you in the comments um, I'm not asking God for I think like the little things I think that um, you know, there's different things that I struggle with. It could be neck pain this week, <laughs> back pain, which is ongoing. And, um, even just like emotional things throughout the day of, of being a busy mother, constantly being pulled in so many different ways by so many different children. <laughs> um, I can find myself just coasting through the day and like relying on, my own strength and not going to him and asking him to help me in those moments. And I love what you said about, you know, if a child asks for 
bread, um, you know, if us evil parents will give it to them, like how, how much more will our, um, earth or heavenly father provide our needs. And I just, I love that because I think oftentimes I'm like, I just want my back pain to go away. I just want the day to go completely smoothly. And maybe that's not what's best for us. And I think about that illustration too, like maybe the child thinks this bread is good, but he doesn't know that underneath it, it's moldy and God will provide the right thing. And so um, right now, maybe it's going through the suffering of having physical ailments or becoming stronger as a believer and as a mother by, you know, not having smooth days with the children. Um, But going to him, I receive the power, right, to push through even those small little moments, even if they don't change. And so I just love, you know, what you shared about this, how it's so important to go to the Father and to desire what He desires and to ultimately what we should desire more than anything else is the things of God, which is, you know, faith, wisdom, discernment, and um, then other things (laughs) will be added as well. And so... Um, yeah, that's, that's my answer. The little things I need to go to God and just constantly be in that communication with him throughout the day. And the times that I have done that, I do notice the joy that I have. And it's because it's a joy that only comes from Christ because I'm like remembering his sufferings. Like he went... I love the verse 12, how it says, treat others how you want to be treated. And he went through the ultimate for us so that we could do that. And he's the one who could ultimately fulfill that. He's the only one who could truly treat us how we want to be treated. And um, so the power comes from Jesus and how he laid his life down willingly for us. There's no greater love than that. And so we can push through the hard moments just as Jesus did on behalf of others um, or even just the things that we're struggling with personally. And so that's just kind of what I got from it. (laughs) And we'd love to hear what you have to say. So what are you not asking God or what have you been asking God for? We'd love to hear and, you know, celebrate with you or pray with you with whatever it is that you're asking God for. Amen. Yeah. I think the the little things can be little to us, but they're big to God. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we can be like, well, that is just a little thing, but it's actually not a big thing. And I think, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's actually a big thing. Cause I think even for you, like asking God for like help with the pain and the neck pain and the back pain for you, I think that you think that it's little to everyone else, but you are so sacrificial and, uh, you don't need a lot. Things like things that would be smaller to others are bigger to you because you, you um, live a very quiet, simple life. And so something like neck pain is huge for you, you know, because, and that's a really big thing. So in your heart, you may be feeling like, I don't know if I don't want to ask God about this or should I go to God to this? Because it is a big thing. It's small to other people. Um, like for me, for example, if I have neck pain, I don't even talk about it. I just kind of go about my day because I'm so like, I need, to be able to scale this mountain. I need to be able to surf these big waves. I need to be able to, I'm like always so distracted by numbers and big things and YouTube analytics and crazy stuff like that. Um, what is big for me is small for you. And so what's big, what's little for you could be big for someone else or what's big for you could be small for someone else. And so um, whatever that thing is, that's hard for you to ask God that's a big thing. Um, sorry, the camera died. And so, um, yeah, I'm excited to see what you guys say. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you may be with Lokilani and it's like personal things that are in your life that you're asked, need to ask God for, 
or maybe it's um, something uh, like for us, like we we were asking and asking God for this van, or we did, we didn't know it was a van at time at the time, and God answered that prayer. Now we're doing an episode in this van. Um, that was a big thing, mm -hmm. and we didn't know how God was going to provide, and He provided through an amazing way, um, through donations that you guys give, um, one in particular, and that was a big thing. Now we're asking God for even bigger things. And, um, and so whether it's a big, whether it's something like that, or whether it's something that's personal, that you had a daily thing that you're struggling with. Um, the, I think of the woman who was bleeding, who had a, a physical impairment, and that was a big thing for her life couldn't go on mm -hmm. because of the bleeding, because of a physical thing that was wrong. And so whether it's a physical pain you're going through, whether it's a property thing, rent, housing, a job thing, a family member, like the centurion, someone close to you that needs healing, whatever it is, if it's big to you, it's big to God. So go to him and ask. Mm -hmm. And I can't wait to hear what you guys say. Yeah, I love that. And I also just want to add, like, I think the enemy wants us to totally like hide our requests, our desires, the things that we need to ask God. So he wants us to, and not that it's absolutely enough just to go to God, but I think there's something special mm -hmm. about the family of God and how he wants us to go to each other and ask mm -hmm. for prayer. He like loves intercession. Jesus interceded for us. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think, you know, the enemy totally wants us to just keep it to ourselves and just, you know, not have others bring others in on the requests that we have. And I think so many of the big prayers that the Lord has answered has happened through you guys praying for us or people close to us or people we don't know that, you know, other people have told about us and they just love to pray. So they prayed for us. Like, I think it's just so beautiful and it just really reflects the body of Christ and um, the unification that he desires for the body. And so, um, I just wanted, I don't know, I just thought of that and just wanted to encourage you in that way as well as find people who will pray for you and find people to pray for. I love that you said find people because you don't want to tell everyone, mm -hmm. but yes. like she said, find those people. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a couple like that, that we just decided we're just going to tell these people what we're asking God for, the big thing we're asking God for. And they said, right on, we'll pray with you. And not only did they pray, they walked our property days and days and days in a row, praying over our property. And when they did that, we were like, really? Like, you really want to pray for the thing that we're praying for? Like, you want the big thing that I'm asking God for? You want that for me as much as I want that <laughs> for me? And uh, they just believed in us. They believed in our ministry. They could see the heart. They could see the vision and they prayed. So like she said, find those people because mm -hmm. the prayer of a righteous person availeth much. Mm -hmm. And when two or three are gathered and they agree on prayer, God is there. And he says, it's as good as done. Mm -hmm. Find that scripture. When two or three are, agree on something on earth, it's done in heaven. And that's because humans don't agree on anything. So it would take the Holy Spirit's power for that to happen. Um, so find those people like she's saying, let us know, what are you not asking God for? What are you asking God for? We love you so much. We'll see you in the next one. Go out and be the church. Amen.